Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is a presentation of the Resilient Power Project, which is managed by Clean Energy Group. And our topic today is financing solar plus storage with federal tax credits. And we have two guest speakers with us today who will be talking more about that. And our host for this webinar is Seth Mollendor. Seth is a project manager at Clean Energy Group with our Resilient Power Project. And before I pass it over to him, I would like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants today are in listen-only mode. That means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you, hopefully. Um, you have a couple of options for connecting to the audio portion of this webinar. You can either use your telephone to call in, or you can use your computer mic and speakers. Um, there's some instructions on your screen, and you can play around with your webinar console to get those options working. Uh, very important, we ask that you submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. And we will be reading through your questions as they come in. We will save about 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please type those in as soon as you think of them and we'll be reading through them and we will answer as many questions as we can at the end. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. You'll find a recording of this webinar and uh, slides that accompany it, as well as all of our previous Resilient Power Project webinars on our website at the web address you see on your screen or at resilient-power.org and also on our Vimeo channel. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our host, Seth Mullendor. Thank you, Sam, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today for the webinar we have. Uh, just want to introduce you to Clean Energy Group, a little brief introduction to start things off. So Clean Energy Group is a national nonprofit. Uh, we work on innovation in finance, technology, and policy for clean energy technologies. Also have a sister organization, which is the Clean Energy States Alliance, and that is a uh, organization of uh, clean energy fund uh, managers across the state. Um, we uh, are coming to you today uh, through the Resilient Power Project. Uh, the Resilient Power Project is uh, generously supported by a number of foundations, the JPB Foundation, Kresge Foundation, CERDNA, as well as the uh, Cummings Foundation. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Resilient Power Project itself. Uh, the project has been going for a couple of years now. Um, Sam, if you could advance to the next. Thank you. Uh, so the, the purpose of the project is to increase uh, public and private investment in clean and resilient power technologies. Uh, the reason the project came about was in the wake of a number of natural disasters. We found that uh, diesel generators were insufficient to help support vulnerable populations when there was a disaster. Uh, they often failed or they weren't there or they just ran out of fuel. So we looked to cleaner more resilient technologies in, in the form most often of uh, solar PV combined with battery storage that's able to island and operate in an outage. Uh, so through this effort, we provide a lot of information, including webinars like this and a number of reports that you can see along the bottom there, accessible on our website, uh, resilient-power.org. Uh, we also have a newsletter and uh, put up a number of blogs and are very active in the space. So we uh, work to engage with public officials, uh, and uh, state officials, as well as developers on the, the local level uh, to both inform and to actually help get resilient power projects done. As I said, there's a particular interest through our project uh, for low income and, and vulnerable populations like the elderly and the disabled. Uh, we work to get resilient power both in the facilities directly, housing facilities, as well as the municipal critical facilities that support them, such as emergency shelters, police and fire stations, and, and other critical public facilities. So we do advocacy both at the state and federal level and work with a lot of uh, programs at the state level and uh, municipal level, and like I said, also with developers. Um, we even do have a small uh, technical assistance grant fund for projects that fit our profile of a resilient power project that uh, supports critical uh, vulnerable communities. Um, so we can provide a bit of funding to help get the initial pre-development costs of those projects going, the, the technical and uh, financial feasibility. So I would like to move on today to our presentation, um, which is uh, financing solar plus storage with tax credits. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have a couple of great speakers here from Deloitte Tax. Uh, first up, we will have Gary Hekimovich, uh, 
And uh, Gary is a partner with Deloitte's Washington National Tax Office. He is a member of the firm's Federal Tax Accounting, Periods, Methods, and Credits Group and has more than 23 years of experience in public accounting, uh, specializing in federal income tax credits and incentives and related accounting method issues. Gary and his team provide due diligence, uh, structuring, application writing, and transactional consulting with respect to a wide array of federal income tax incentives, including energy tax credits, renewable energy production tax credits, ARRA, 1603 cash grants, new market tax credits, qualifying advanced energy project credits, qualifying therapeutic discovery project credits, historic rehabilitation tax credits, low-income housing tax credits, and various other incentives. Uh, he's a frequent public speaker and published author on federal tax credits. His articles have appeared in Tax Notes, Journal of Accountancy, and the Tax Advisor. Gary, Gary uh, previously served as a moderator for the firm's federal tax debrief webcast series and serves on the AICPA technical resource panel on accounting periods and methods. Uh, we also have Joel Meister with us today. Uh, Joel is an attorney and manager with the uh, Deloitte's Washington National Tax Practice in the Federal Accounts Periods Methods and Credits Group. Joel previously served as Assistant General Counsel at the energy storage startup Solar Grid Storage LLC before it was acquired by Sun Edison, which is the uh, largest renewable energy developer in the world. His duties included all legal and regulatory matters with an emphasis on tax issues associated with the uh, Section 48 investment tax credit, uh, project financing structures, energy storage assets, and energy storage assets participation in grid services markets. Previously, Joel concentrated on tax and financing issues for four years at the Solar Energy Industries Association, SIA, which is the National Trade Association for the U.S. solar industry. On behalf of developers and project venture, uh, investors, he uh, modeled, monitored the Section 1603 Treasury Grant Program and tax equity financing trends for renewable energy projects. He also analyzed emergence, emerging and proposed financing solutions for clean energy, such as yield codes, master limited partnerships, real estate investment trusts, and asset securitization. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Gary. Uh, also a reminder, please do enter your questions as we go along. Uh, we have a lot of people today, so we will get to as many of them as we can at uh, the end of the talk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Gary uh, coming from, to you from rainy Washington, D.C. Uh, we have over almost 250 attendees on this call. We're very honored to have an opportunity to discuss what may be one of the hottest issues uh, in federal income tax, at least on the renewable energy side, uh, there's an enormous amount of interest in new technologies and financing new technologies, pairing storage with solar and other renewable uh, resources. And the timing couldn't be better for this discussion uh, as the intersection of additional IRS and Treasury guidance with the emergence of these technologies that are coming to the fore right now. Uh, a little bit about Deloitte's practice. Uh, Joel and I are members of our Washington National Tax Practice. Uh, you heard you heard a little bit about our bios. Uh, we're both very active in the uh, solar and the renewable energy space, and uh, we're very active uh, currently uh, working with many groups that are, are uh, drafting comments to the IRS on some of the issues that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I'm really pleased to introduce Joel Meister here. Joel is truly one of the one of the smartest uh, guys in the country on on uh, solar and storage and uh, he's going to be our play-by-play -play man today so I really appreciate everyone's uh, logging in we'll try to answer your questions as, as we go and I'll turn it over to Joel to get us going great thank you Gary uh, and it's great uh, thank you Seth and Sam for and clean energy group generally for uh, having us uh, it was great to hear that introduction with Clean energy group focusing on the intersections of finance, tax, uh, technology, and policy. Uh, those are some of the overlapping issues that are certainly um, coming to the fore, as Gary noted, with respect to energy storage. So I can't think of a, a better partner to put on this webinar than, than Clean Energy Group. So uh, thank you for all you're doing on the energy storage side, and, and it's great to be with you all. So as we kind of start our discussion, um, just wanted to give an overview of, of what we're going to be talking about today. One, just wanted to set the scene, lay the foundation of why energy storage is becoming so popular. Then we'll turn to the tax code specifically. I know uh, 
probably everyone's starting to get their W-2s, starting to look uh, to uh, submitting their tax returns. Not a lot of people like to look to the tax code, but that's what we do on a daily basis because if you've been involved in financing a, a renewable energy project, uh, a lot of that financing, a lot of the due diligence does require a very specific and, and studious uh, attention to the tax code and tax regulations uh, with respect to qualifying components and systems and facilities broadly uh, for the, the appropriate tax credits. And so that's, that's what we've certainly been doing on the energy storage front. Uh, then we'll pivot to looking at, once we get beyond tax credits for storage broadly, we'll look at some of the specific issues we see with uh, specific use cases. As many of you are probably aware, there are many different ways you can use an energy storage device. And I think as we go, we'll, we'll probably use a battery uh, for shorthand, but uh, you know, we'll acknowledge at the outset that certainly many different types of technologies could be used in energy storage, but we'll, we'll likely uh, focus on, on batteries because that's certainly the, the most popular recurring technology uh, uh, that, that we're seeing. Then we'll take some time to just look ahead. Uh, what's to come? It's hard to project too much about the industry or industries because they're so fast moving, but we will look at some of the issues and challenges for developers and investors for current projects, as well as look at, uh, as Gary mentioned, new regulations that should uh, or could be coming down uh, uh, the road here soon, and uh, at least what the role is for uh, industry and individual companies uh, to at least inform that process um, while uh, new regulations are being considered. So first, again, just to take a step back, you know, why are we looking at energy storage and, and tax credits. Well, we have falling costs of different technologies between wind turbines and solar panels. You know, we've seen a number of years uh, since the Energy Policy Act of 2005, frankly, where uh, some of these tax credits uh, were, were um, at least the values were increased. We saw uh, considerable development and deployment. And we're starting to see a similar trend in energy storage as more and more manufacturers are ramping up supply they're investing in R&D, uh, they're starting to bring down those costs for the technology, be they lithium ion or, or other technologies. And you're starting to see them uh, increasingly look for new uses for those uh, storage capabilities um, uh, over time. Uh, some states have started to recognize the value of storage and they've started to incentivize adoption, especially after Hurricane Sandy and other extreme weather events. You've started to see states like Connecticut and New Jersey pass uh, microgrid, microgrid funding um, programs or solar plus storage programs. And then on the other side of the country, on the West Coast, you've seen California um, actually put in place mandates requiring utilities to acquire a certain amount of storage capacity, uh, just as they've implemented mandates for acquiring certain amounts of renewable energy, citing the benefits of having that fast responding storage capability in their overall grid infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no tax incentive in place currently for standalone energy storage, which and I say unfortunately because that can make it a little difficult in terms of um, uh, deploying these, these assets. And so because there's no standalone storage device incentive, like an investment tax credit, uh, there's been considerable interest in just the last few years in pairing those storage devices with otherwise tax credit eligible projects. And this has become all the more interesting after recent legislation known as tax extenders in December of last year that actually extended by at least two years uh, tax credits for certain technologies. And in the wind and solar context, we actually saw a five-year extension, which we'll get into in a second. So that provides a, a pretty significant runway for developers to look for opportunities to pair these technologies. So I talked about some of the, the use cases. This is a good graphic from Rocky Mountain Institute. I won't dwell on this in, in too much detail, but just to note that, you know, as, as people are looking at batteries, they're starting to realize that there's tremendous value in the ability to simply hold uh, energy as it's being produced and to be able to discharge it at a late, later point in time. Uh, at the customer level, that's certainly apparent uh, in terms of allowing a, a homeowner or other uh, business to uh, perhaps use the energy when the, the sun is no longer shining. Uh, but at the utility and the grid uh, operator level, uh, we certainly see benefits through uh, ancillary services like frequency regulation. And 
The downside to this, though, is that when you are looking at this from a tax and legal perspective, the overlapping of technologies and the overlapping of use cases can actually make it a little more difficult to identify and confirm and determine the extent to which these technologies are eligible for a tax credit because they might be used in different ways. So just briefly, what are the primary tax benefits that we're talking about? Uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with the production tax credit or PTC and the investment tax credit. Uh, this just provides a summary slide for uh, the timing of benefits, the PTC under Section 45. That provides a credit per kilowatt hour of electricity that is produced by the, by the system. Uh, and then the electricity must be sold to a third party and it can be claimed over a period of 10 years. Whereas the investment tax credit is a credit that is claimed on a portion of the basis or cost of the equipment. Uh, depending on the technology you're talking about, it's either 10% or 30%. And that credit is actually claimed in the, the year that you place the equipment in service, although it vests 20% each year uh, for the first five years. But you, you do have a difference in the timing of the tax benefits. And then obviously through makers, you have accelerated depreciation deductions. It also provides significant tax benefits to the taxpayer. Sorry about that. So uh, with the, the credits that we currently have, this just shows the time horizons. As I noted, for both wind and solar, we had a, a multi-year extension, and this provides just a, a high-level summary of the time frames we're talking about, where uh, people have become more interested in pairing these technologies because, in, in the case of wind, uh, we're looking at projects being able to claim credits uh, as far out as uh, 20, uh, 2020, if they began construction on those projects. And in the case of solar, uh, it goes out even further uh, to 2022 to be able to uh, claim a credit. I should know that you can even place, in the case of solar, you can place property and service after 2024 because the uh, solar credit will actually phase down to a permanent 10% credit, uh, which is unlike some of the other technologies under Section 48. So the, the takeaway here is there's with the new legislation, there's really a long timeline here of these applicable incentives being in the law, which help financing for preparing storage with certain types of renewable energy. So moving on, just looking at the credits and, and how they can be used in the energy storage context, I, I think it, it's clear to most people that being able to claim a federal tax credit on the cost of a storage device like a battery could be valuable. In the PTC context, which is more applicable for wind, the, the PTC on storage would not be directly beneficial because, like I said, the credit is based on how much electricity you're producing, and a battery is simply charging with that electricity and then discharging at a later point in time. Um, however, we do note that wind project developers are seeing value from the ability to store their wind energy and then be able to discharge it later if, for example, they're subject to curtailment where the electrons that they're producing would otherwise be lost and they would otherwise lose uh, a certain amount of revenue. So under Section 48, uh, unlike Section 45 and that where tax credit eligibility is based on a facility level, Section 48 directly contemplates a variety of individual components that comprise a solar energy project or system uh, that would be considered eligible, and it specifically includes uh, energy storage devices. For PTC technologies, there's also precedent for energy storage being included. Um, however, it would require an analysis and determination at the outset that that storage device is integral to the facility. Um, and you've certainly seen a few private letter rulings, which we'll get into over the last few years, looking at wind facilities and certainly concluding that a storage device, depending on how it's used, could be considered uh, integral to that facility. So focusing on the ITC here, uh, the investment credit actually traces its roots back to an, a, an early investment credit uh, in 1962. It wasn't until 1978 with the Energy Tax Act of 78 that a specific tax credit was passed for energy property. And in the ensuing regulations that were promulgated, they specifically mentioned storage devices 
or solar, wind, and geothermal. Those were the technologies uh, that qualified at the time. But uh, there was one caveat, and, and this will be an issue that we talk about throughout this presentation. Under those old rules in the 80s, if, the, if property used both the qualified generation source, like the solar, the wind, or the geothermal, and it also used a non-qualified energy source, it was deemed dual-use property or dual-use equipment, and it was not considered qualifying energy property. So if you, let's say we had a battery in the early 1980s, although it'd be pretty expensive at the time, if you had a battery and you were charging that with both solar as well as uh, energy from a diesel generator or some other non-solar uh, source, then you couldn't claim an ITC at all on that storage device. However, in 1987, the United States Treasury actually reconsidered its position on that and adopted what has come to be known as the 75% cliff uh, that thereby allows uh, a taxpayer to claim an ITC on at least a portion of that storage device's basis. So on this next slide, what I've done is I've just excerpted uh, what Treasury did. As I said, it reconsidered the legislative history, and it went all the way back to the, the late 1970s, and it concluded, and this is the Treasury, they concluded that Congress did not intend to adopt an all-or-nothing rule for dual-use solar, wind, or geothermal energy property. Neither the statute nor the legislative history include this restriction. And so in the final uh, regulations that they came out with, they came out with this so-called 75% cliff. They said, okay, well, if you have property that's using both solar and non-solar, or in the case of wind and geothermal, those sources, the dual-use property can qualify, but only to the extent of the property's basis or cost allocable to its annual use of the qualified energy resource. But in addition, the cliff that we mentioned is this next uh, clause to say, so long as the use of non-qualified non energy does not exceed 25% of the total energy input in an annual measuring period. So that means if your uh, charging of that battery is more than 25%, then you would not be able to claim an ITC at all on that dual-use property. So essentially you would fall off that cliff. So tracing brown power versus green power. Right. And, and we'll get into some of the difficulties uh, with that. In the, the second bullet point, it said the allocation may be made by comparing on a BTU basis energy input to dual-use property from qualified sources with energy input from other sources. So the annual, uh, annual measuring period would be the 365 days beginning on the date that you placed in service. So it wouldn't be on a calendar year. It would be based on the day you placed it in service and the year that follows. And you actually have to do that measurement each year for the five years that your investment tax credit vests. As I mentioned before, your credit will vest 20% each year until it finishes at the, the end of year five. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions. Why do they specifically say on a BTU basis? That's in the regulations. Well, if you recall, the regulations were promulgated in the late 1970s and, and early 1980s where solar water heating was the dominant solar technology. And if you're familiar with those systems, they have storage devices to hold hot water. And so the legislative history clearly mentions electric storage, but I think when they were drafting those regulations, probably the primary issue that they were looking at, or the primary use case, was in a thermal storage context. And that's why you see, for all practical purposes, uh, the, the emphasis of thermal. But going to that third bullet point, I should note that uh, in the regulation that states that the commis commissioner or the IRS can accept any other method that, in its opinion, more accurately establishes the relative use of energy from the qualified and non-qualified sources. And uh, if your usage of that energy drops, then in that last bullet, recapture is required. And as far as how recapture works, uh, that's basically a way to say if, for example, you used 80% uh, solar energy when you did your annual measurement, and then it drops to 75% uh, in at the end of year one, for example, then you actually have to give back to the federal government a portion of the credit you claim that's equal to that 5% drop. So this is an example from the regulations that's actually in the rules, and as you can see, it, it focuses on a solar water heating system, 
it gives a pretty detailed explanation or summary of the components that are in a hypothetical solar water heating system, and it actually applies the dual-use rule. Unfortunately, it doesn't provide much clarity. It simply says in the write-up, on a BTU basis, 80% of the energy input is from solar energy. So unfortunately for all taxpayers, it doesn't provide much clarity on how you actually come up with that measurement, which we'll talk about later. But in this next slide, we can actually see how they break down what's eligible and what's non-eligible. So if we focus on the uh, right-hand corner of the dual-use equipment, this was a device, uh, a storage tank, and other components that were both using the energy from a solar water heating system, as well as technically using energy provided by a backup diesel generator um, to back up the solar system when the sun wasn't shining, for example. And in that case, the, uh, the example provides that both the distribution pipe and the control components, as well as the uh, storage device, um, or are going to be dual-use equipment and subject to that, um, that ITC haircut. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the evolution in the tax treatment. Um, because of these technologies just emerging in the last few years, there's actually little case law ap applying the dual-use rules. Uh, to the extent there are authorities out there, they mostly focus on thermal systems. Uh, but we do know most recently uh, in the past five or six years, uh, Treasury has applied these rules to 1603 grant projects, which is technically outside of the tax code, but eligibility for 1603 grants was certainly um, developed and built on the foundation of tax principles uh, under the ITC. And beginning in 2011, we would actually see a handful of private letter rulings uh, that would address energy storage. Gary, do you want to take a quick second just to maybe summarize what a private letter ruling is, generally speaking, and what the precedential value is there? Sure. So what a private letter ruling is is a specific taxpayer has a specific fact pattern, and where the law is not clear on how that fact pattern should be governed, for example, ITC eligibility in a specific fact pattern based on the configuration of a battery system within a larger renewable energy project, it raises issues that, from a financing perspective, certainty might be required. So what a private letter ruling is, is a group that has a situation like that, real facts that can't be hypothetical, and you go to the IRS, you pay a fee, you meet with the IRS, you provide your facts, your analysis, and the IRS rules for purposes of your specific scenario, they will rule and affirm the, uh, the federal income tax treatment. So it's a very important uh, tool that, although not precedential beyond the specific taxpayer that gets the private letter ruling, often the logic in those private letter rulings are, are uh, relied upon in evaluating eligibility under similar fact patterns. So this table uh, is my attempt to summarize some of those recent rulings uh, on energy storage. So there were three that I think caused the most uh, or raised the most eyebrows when people started realizing that, oh, the IRS was looking at energy storage and some of these tax credit issues. Uh, before then, uh, there was interest in energy storage, but um, there was some uncertainty because simply uh, it was a new technology and, and not many people had actually worked on these projects. Um, but the main breakdown is you'll see in, in 2011 there were two private letter rulings issued uh, related to utility scale wind farms. And in one case uh, a battery was added to an existing uh, project and in another case a battery was being added to uh, a new build, a new project that was being built. And in both cases the ruling tried to determine and ask for clarification on ITC eligibility. And interestingly enough uh, despite what we've talked about over the last 20 minutes or so, uh, the IRS concluded actually that um, both uh, storage devices in both cases were 100% eligible uh, for the ITC. Now, fast forward to November 2012, uh, as the IRS had looked into energy storage a bit more, uh, they got an additional ruling request, this time on, as we understand it, a rooftop solar PV system that was going to be incorporating batteries. Uh, imagine it's either a residential or a commercial context. 
And in that situation, it described many of the same uses that the two previous PLRs listed, notably frequency regulation, where the storage device would be charging and discharging from both the solar energy as well as energy from the grid in order to provide grid services and, and stabilize the grid. And in that third PLR in 2012, the IRS concluded that, no, it was not 100% eligible. Instead, the dual-use equipment rules would apply, and the taxpayer would have to provide some kind of ITC haircut uh, corresponding to the amount of non-solar energy that's input to that storage device. So you, you can see right there between those three PLRs uh, an evolution in, in the way that the, the IRS had been looking at some of these issues. And then in 2014 and 2015, we had two additional PLRs. I just wanted to note them. They don't specifically address the dual-use equipment rules, uh, but in the 2014 PLR, we had a small storage device attached to a, as we understand it, a solar light pole, uh, and the IRS did conclude that that was eligible for the ITC. Uh, in that last PLR, that was actually related to a storage device with no renewable energy generation. It was just providing frequency regulation, so it was not paired with a renewable source. Uh, and so there was no discussion about tax credit eligibility, but I wanted to be sure I highlighted it for you all as you're, as you're going through some of these authorities. So what are some of the, the takeaways as we, as we move on? One, like I said, you know, the IRS has uh, become better educated about energy storage, uh, better educated about how those systems are integrated with the renewable energy. We think, you know, the technology was very new, and so over time they certainly tried to get um, better educated on the technologies, the market segments, and the use cases. But with so many different factors, uh, one could understand how the IRS or, or policy officials generally uh, may not be completely up to speed uh, on these on these use cases and some of the tax ramifications. I'm certainly not an engineer. Uh, I do my best to talk to the engineers, but I'm always learning things, even though I've been looking at energy storage for a few years now. So it has been an education process, I think, for both the industry as well as the IRS on tax credit eligibility. Uh, I think one thing to keep in mind, though, is that based on that third PLR, it would be questionable whether one would read too much into those two wind PLRs uh, Rather, I, I think you would likely see for a new wind project with a new storage device that the IRS would expect the dual-use equipment rules to apply to that, that storage device in that context, notwithstanding the two previous PLRs. So let's move on to some of the use cases that, that we've started to see um, in the market and, and people talking about it as we you know, go to conferences, we speak with clients, uh, et cetera. One is just the pairing of the the qualified energy generation or the solar or wind resource um, with ancillary services like frequency regulation where you're charging and discharging that energy storage. Um, in, the, in the two initial wind PLRs, the IRS noted that the energy is drawn temporarily from the grid, but uh, it seemed at least based on the third solar PLR that the IRS will conclude that that charging and discharging, however brief it may be, at least under the current rules, will be considered uh, you know, use of uh, potentially non-solar energy um, based on how they understand the storage devices interacting with the grid and potentially drawing energy from the grid in addition to the solar source. Uh, this has made all the more complex in behind the meter configurations, which is the second kind of use case that we've seen, um, whether it's frequency regulation or other instances where energy could be coming from the grid, uh, like uh, demand charge management in the uh, commercial context, uh, you have overlap overlapping functionality in, in many behind the meter systems. So you have bi-directional inverters, so energy could be coming in as well as going out. Um, as Gary noted that the idea of trying to tag electrons can be difficult the further you move behind the meter. And so as we've talked with companies and, and, and other folks, um, documenting as much as possible the technical configuration of your equipment, trying to track how the electrons are flowing. Um, on the front end, when you're just designing your system, it's really important to be able to understand, at a later stage, your tax credit eligibility consideration. Uh, and, you know, if all of you out there have been looking at particular use cases and, and designing systems, 
you know there are different ways that you can have DC coupled, AC coupled, different components involved. Uh, and so it really does take a, a full analysis on the front end, given the amount of evolution that we've seen at the IRS. Uh, to make sure you're documenting what you think is your foundation for claiming the ITC. Uh, in addition, we've seen qualifying energy sources like solar uh, paired with other on-site generation. Uh, an easy example is a microgrid where you might have a, a solar facility, but you also might have other on-site generation like a CHP facility or um, uh, a diesel generator, things like that. And, you know, it might be the commercial viability might be very specific to a specific client or case, uh, but in those situations you could perhaps have the storage device charging from the solar as well as the other uh, non-renewable energy resource. And in that situation, you do need to document, um, you know, what what is the path of electrons, to what extent will you have charging from another resource. Uh, if you read the rules literally, um, the dual-use equipment rules seem to suggest that the individual resource, like solar, has to meet the 75% cliff rule, which could be problematic if, for example, you had a battery that was hooked up to both a solar facility and a wind facility. If the inputs were 50-50 split between the two, technically under the, the regulations, that would not meet the 75% cliff. And I know that that's somewhat splitting hairs, but as you read the regulations, uh, those are some of the perhaps unintended consequences, but consequences nonetheless. So Joel, that's, that's a good reason why we need new regulations, correct? That, that's one of the, the issues that we've seen cited for potentially rethinking or at least revising some of those rules, uh, which we can, we can speak to in a, in a few moments. So we, we touched on these at different points, but we just want to drill uh, down a little bit further on the tax technical issues. Uh, one, drawing the box. So we noted dual-use equipment, you have to monitor your inputs as far as solar and non-solar energy. But there are other components, and the, the Treasury regulation example that we summarized went into this where it was not just the storage device that was dual-use and would require a haircut, but there are other components related to the functioning of the system uh, that could use both solar energy and non-solar. So when you're drawing the box, as we like to do here at Deloitte, around what components will be dual use and potentially subject to a haircut, just recognize that that could include other components otherwise, other than the storage device that might otherwise be 100% eligible without a storage device. Uh, the section, second issue is uh, new build versus retrofits. What happens if you add storage to an existing project? Third, what happens if you have separate ownership of the, the components? And then what are some issues for uh, actually drilling down on a dual use methodology? Uh, that will work. Um, I think I actually went through the drawing the box, so I'll, I'll skip that. I think retrofits is, is a hot topic right now because you've seen so much deployment in the solar and wind context. And at least as far as I've talked to folks and heard people speaking at conferences and, and in between panels, I think there's a lot of confusion about the extent to which you can claim a credit on a storage device if it's added to an existing project. Um, Although it, it's certainly an issue that requires uh, precision and analysis, uh, we think there are, as we've looked at this and looked at it with clients, uh, we certainly see scenarios and circumstances in which you can claim an ITC on a storage device uh, that's integrated into and paired with uh, a renewable energy project, be it you know, a wind facility, for example, or, or a solar facility. But there are many issues to consider. So we uh, certainly work with the clients for example, there's a pretty sophisticated test for when you are placed in service. Uh, and so, you know, when the original system was placed in service, when the new property was placed in service, how the components are integrated, those are all questions that really go to eligibility overall. Um, in terms of what authorities are out there, we have seen instances both in the 1603 context um, uh, and ITC context uh, where those res retrofits uh, were occurring. Um, but again, those relate, those um, lead to additional issues like split ownership, uh, splitting a 1603 grant versus the ITC. Uh, hi, Joel. This is Seth. I just want to um, let you know that we've got about five minutes left for a presentation, and um, then we'll get to a long list of questions that we have um, growing here. Okay. So 
you guys have questions, um, get them in, and we'll we'll get to those soon. Okay. So I'm, I'm maybe go through some of these issues uh, quickly, and we can drill into them if people want in the Q and A. So separate ownership, where you've had um, we've seen situations where different entities will be owning the storage relative to the generation. Uh, again, um, a, a new um, a new issue, but we certainly see authorities out there in the 1603 context, as well as the residential ITC context for uh, solar uh, projects with the 25 cap DPLR that came out recently that speak to uh, the issue of separate ownership and nonetheless uh, lead to conclusions that the property can remain ITC uh, eligible, remain ITC eligible. Um, I'm going to move on. So the dual use methodology, that's, that's another big uh, issue. This is kind of a, a very simple calculation of, of how one might go about applying uh, a haircut. This is used the 80% example from the Treasury regs. And uh, again, bear in mind that you do that calculation on the front end when you're claiming your ITC, but then you're also going to have to check that measurement at the end of each annual measuring period to make sure if, in this case, you have 80%. In the next year, if you go down to 79% or 75%, uh, you're going to have to have proportional recapture. And if you drop below 75%, then you'll be subject to full recapture, again, falling off the cliff, subject to full recapture on whatever portion of the ITC has not yet vested. So there's an intended use and then an actual use, and you have to true it up. Right. So uh, I'll just get back to, to looking ahead. So Gary noted the possibility of new regulations in October, the IRS issued Notice 2015-70, which uh, goes to the definition of energy property under Section 48. And there are a number of issues that were spelled out, and I'll actually uh, pull them up right now. Uh, specific issues identified where the IRS and Treasury have invited public comment in anticipation of new regulations being issued. So they are very clear that what they get from this process could lead to new regulation. And I just wanted to highlight for energy storage, basically their storage is implicated in three of those five situations. One, definitions around what constitutes storage devices, uh, whether dual use property should qualify and to what extent. That's going straight to the 75% cliff, uh, the measurement method, et cetera. Uh, and then again on number four, just more broadly, what is a storage device? So I think it's a mix of both policy questions as well as just definitional issues. So what does that process look like? Um, this timeline um, shows when it was issued, October. Um, comments are due February 16th, so about 13 days from now. Um, I know a number of folks have been eagerly on the government side uh, looking for uh, comments from a, a wide variety of stakeholders, industry, individual companies, et cetera. We think that because of the scope of this project, proposed regulations probably wouldn't be issued until the spring of 2017, in which case there would be additional opportunities for feedback, both in written form as well as in person, and then potentially final regulations in the fall of 2018. So somewhat of a long process, but we know of regulations that have certainly taken multiple years to, to get out even in proposed form, uh, but we do know that uh, you know this this is IRS and Treasury really trying to get a better understanding of these issues and in the current commercial context um, how those rules should be applied and are there situations where they should be revised. And I can only add add to that, Joel, that I, I walked over here from Treasury from a meeting today and there's a lot of interest, a lot of attention on this new reg project and that and the, the realization of the you know that the, the uh, expanding of of this whole area of uh, energy storage paired with uh, renewables is of great interest to the government right now. So my last slide, just to sum up, um, looking ahead, some considerations. One, if this is an area where you're interested and, and you want future regulations to more clearly reflect, reflect the, the usage of these components and storage and renewable energy, certainly consider commenting by February 16th. Um, there's an email address and then a snail mail um, address that you can use if you want to uh, submit comments. Anyone can submit comments, an individual taxpayer, a trade association, a company. Um, and just note that because of the ability for PTC technologies to claim the ITC, the so-called ITC in lieu of PTC, we would certainly think that 
TTC Technologies would have an interest in commenting on this. Now, what about the interim? Um, we think that it's unlikely that new PLRs would be issued on these issues while the IRS and Treasury are considering new regulations. Um, and so what we try to do with our clients is really delve into the current rules, the fact pattern, the circumstances for the taxpayer and the use of the device, and really do our best to document on the front end the, the arguments and the position um, if we think it can be eligible for the ITC. So looking at how you're going to measure the usage, looking at your metering, uh, and looking at other procedures to mitigate any kind of risk that you could, like I said before, fall off that 75% that cliff. So with that, um, Seth, I'll turn it over to you for questions. All right. Thanks so much, Joel and Gary. It was uh, great information, great presentation. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so uh, we will get to as many as we can. I, I think, Joel, you said you have a little bit of leeway and staying a bit over the hour, so we'll uh, maybe run a little bit long today um, just to get to as many questions as we can. I think just great. an overarching thing uh, to point to first is um, there's some confusion uh, about the, the standing of energy storage paired with solar today. Um, from what I've understood, it seems like the way that the IRS rules are currently put together, um, the official rules, that energy storage does qualify for the ITC, but there are a lot of gray areas that are addressed through PLRs that are not codified at this time. Is that correct? Well, the, the PLRs certainly do not uh, add anything to the regulations. So the, the PLR as a, as a tool is meant to look at the regulations, look at the statute, and then apply them to a particular requesting taxpayers facts and circumstances. So you know, we, we'll always go back to the statute, the, the regulations, the legislative history to further inform um, our understanding of those gray areas, as you said. Um, and PLRs certainly provide some indication to industry about how the IRS and Treasury are, are perhaps looking at an issue in a moment in time, but it is a snapshot. It, it can only be relied upon by that taxpayer. And there are circumstances where PLRs have actually been revoked um, by the IRS after the fact. So they can be informative and inform the understanding of those gray areas, but uh, at the end of the day, you do need to go to the treasury, the regs and, and the statute and and go from there as far as, you know, coming up with an ultimate conclusion. Yeah, so I, I would put it this way, Seth, to, to just to, to streamline it, I would say yes, that battery storage itself is contemplated within the current set of regulations as being ITC eligible. However, like other aspects of the regulations for Section 48 ITC purposes, those regs were last updated in 1987. So, so there was no foresight into the technologies that we see today. So the government generally at this point is applying the dual-use property rules that, that Joel explained and the 75% cliff to the application of ITC eligibility without any clear guidance in the old rules how you do measurements and you know, just leaves a lot open for for interpretation. Right, great, thank you. Um, also, just to let people know, uh, for those of you that came in a little bit late, that the slides and recording will both be available online, and we'll be sending out an email uh, when that's available. So, for those of you that would like to go back over the slides or any of the information in, in the presentation, uh, so we had a couple of questions. People were wondering about the fact that the ITC is a, a one-time credit, um, but yet there's this 20% over five years, the, the vesting period. Can you just kind of uh, explain that a little bit more? Sure. So as a, as a policy mechanism, the, the ITC gives you an un, upfront tax benefit when you place the property in service, but um, the recapture rules generally are there to kind of hold the taxpayer's feet to the fire in a way to say, well, you could technically build a project, claim a credit on it, and then get rid of it or, or sell it off, and thereby allowing you to keep a tax benefit even though you have no ties to that, that property. And generally, recapture rules, like I said, the, the credit traces its roots back to 1962 when there was a, a broader investment credit available for all sorts of types of property. And because of the wide uh, eligibility for that credit, there were some situations in which – 
taxpayers engaged in abusive tax shelters to get tax benefits and with little intention to carry on a trade or business. And so the recapture rules are uh, they're a way to make sure that if the taxpayer is getting a tax benefit, that it has to hold it for a certain period of time, in this case five years, and it does that by having that 20% vesting each year. So that if you sold it in year two, for example, um, only 20% will have vested at that point, and so you'd have to essentially on your tax return give back that additional 80% of the tax credit. So that is not the dual use recapture scenario is specific to dual use equipment, but the recapture rules generally are applicable to solar uh, tax credits, so your solar panels uh, and other components that make up the system. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Uh, so related to the recapture for dual use, um, is the annual determination of, of qualified versus non-qualified uh, energy sources, is that something that's required by the IRS and audited each year, or, or, and do they provide any guidance for how that process could be done? Sure. Well, as far as what the regulations say, they do say, you know, on an annual measuring period, you should come up with that percentage. If it is less than what you initially claimed, uh, you are supposed to report that on the tax return. Um, as a recap. As a, as a recapture, like any other uh, recapture event, like if you sold the the property. So uh, conceivably, if you know, if you were on audit, uh, that would be an issue potentially they could raise uh, if they were looking at your project with solar and battery storage. Uh, the PLRs are out there. There is there are the regulations. So if you're dealing with someone who's had experience with the ITC solar regulations, uh, this could be an issue they ask for. And this is why we always stress having that documentation on the front end because of the evolution in the private letter rulings, having an analysis on the front end establishing your ITC eligibility is much better than when someone's asking you questions and then you're trying to, to rush to put together some kind of response. Right. I'll just add to it that the annual measuring period that's in the current regulations makes sense from the standpoint of the recapture rule in general, in general, if vesting occurs in tranches over a three or over a five-year annual period after the property is placed in service, so the rules are written like that. What is not clear in the rules is, you know, yes, you have to make this determination on annual period, but but how granular do you have to get? Do you measure inputs on a daily, hourly, monthly, you know, semi-annually? Basis. Though none of that is clear in the current set of regulations and is an area that the IRS is seeking comment. Yeah, okay, so it sounds like there's still a lot of, of, of open interpretation there. Um, one question on uh, adding storage to an existing system. Um, from your presentation, it sounds like you can claim the ITC for uh, storage added at a later time. Uh, I was wondering, is there any sort of guidance for does it have to be within the same tax year as the solar installation, or does it matter? Uh, a great question. Uh, I actually heard that position at a at a conference recently. Someone kind of said uh, on a panel that they had taken the position that well, as long as you add the storage in the year in which the solar project generally is, is placed in service, that that would likely be okay. Um, I think a, a a more precise technical reading of the regulations and the authorities as they exist today suggests that, uh, you know, if you are adding that storage device, which is mentioned in the regulations and legislative history as, as potentially being energy property when paired with a, a, a solar resource, if you add it, even if it's outside of the, the year in which you place in service, um, we think that there are circumstances in which you can claim the ITC with the caveat that you would still need to comply with all the other rules about the 75% clip and, and things like that. Yeah, so the, the way I think it's good to hear to, to really emphasize the, the construct of the investment tax credit in the context of a solar investment tax credit. The investment tax credit itself had its genesis in, in uh, encouraging certain qualifying activities in any unit of property, component parts, of a system, any unit of property which is essential to the completeness of that activity can constitute 
you know, itself, each component, each unit of property is meeting the definition of energy property, which is ITC eligible. So it's on that basis that you can, you can have component parts added to an existing qualifying activity, which is where component parts are qualified for the ITC, and if the, the addition or retrofit to the same overall qualifying activity meets the integral requirement, uh, you know, is considered essential to the completeness of the qualifying activity, then you reanalyze that new investment and if it's placed in service in the right time period and it satisfies the dual use requirements, it's, it qualifies for an investment tax credit. That's certainly our view at Deloitte. That is one of the things that I think we really like to see clarified in future IRS guidance. Great. So, uh, our discussion here today focused mainly on, on Section 48 of the tax code. The discussion here, uh, if there's any indication that the, the IRS would pre treat storage in the same way for a residential taxpayer uh, installing solar and storage under Section 25D. Right. Uh, that, that's actually a great question, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if commenters on the, you know, who are submitting comments by February 16th I wouldn't be surprised if they actually looked at some of the rules around 25 cap D to kind of inform how the regulation should be revised. Um, technically under the regulations, uh, or the, the notice about potential new regulations, it would just be 48. So it is highly unlikely that they would also wrap 25 cap D into it. Um, so you, you would likely not see new regulations. Uh, but I would note that it is interesting if you go to 25 cap D, and this is the the case where the homeowner purchases the solar equipment, places it in service, and claims the credit on their personal income tax return, that uh, the rules are actually uh, a bit more uh, lenient. relaxed, lenient, or flexible <laughs> as compared to Section 48. For example, in the solar water heating context, in the statute itself, it notes that the property can be 100% eligible if um, at least 50% of the energy used by such property is derived from the sun, which is in effect a, an implicit dual use rule. Uh, and the, the solar electric uh, portion of that language merely notes that the property has to use solar energy. So as, from my perspective, as far as a more um, contemporary or modern view of, of the dual use rules, I think looking at 25 cap D would certainly um, be good in the process of revising the regulation. Uh, but to answer your question very succinctly, we don't see any um, implications for 25 cap D in this process. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we've had a f few questions on this as far as how the system is actually configured. Um, does the, the solar and the battery, do they have to be one interconnected system DC coupled so it flows directly from solar to storage? Or can you have separate connections, um, so uh, like an AC-coupled system, where they may use different inverters? Right. Um, so we've seen a, a couple of different configurations thrown around in, in the industry. And again, uh, this is where it does get into to facts and circumstances where, you know, we are going to be asking questions about, okay, although you might have these components, can you trace for us how the electrons are moving? And if you can demonstrate, you know, in your system that solar energy is making its way into that, that storage device, um, you know, we think there's, there's likely a foundation for um, the property being ITC, uh, ITC eligible with the caveat of the 75% cliff uh, and things like that. So the regulations are not clear or do not prescribe a certain technical configuration. So giving a definitive answer, we need to look at the specific configuration uh, so that, you know, we can actually document. I, I Frankly, I, I have talked to folks where they say, or I've heard of projects that are solar plus storage, and then if you actually drill down into the weeds of how the system was configured, they're essentially two completely systems, uh, completely different systems. There's no solar energy at all ever going into the battery. And in that case, you might call it a solar plus storage system, but for tax purposes and ITC eligibility purposes, uh, that, that that will probably be a, a risky endeavor. <laughs>
Okay, yeah. Um, so we are a little bit past the 2 o'clock mark here. I'd like to, to try to get to a, a few more questions. I, I apologize we're not going to get to all of them. We still have quite a list, and people are still submitting more. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to, to Joel and Gary about any questions you have here, or feel free to, to reach us at Clear Energy Group. If we don't know the answer, we can forward it along to them. Uh, so, But we'll move along right now. Um, just to expand on, on this topic a little bit, so is there any proximity requirements? So if the, the system is actually interconnected um, and you can show that the, the electrons flow from the solar to the storage facility, does it matter if the storage is located remotely as long as it is directly connected to, to the solar? Uh, again, I, we'd have to look at the, the facts and circumstances to see overall how the system is installed, how it's how it's being used. But again, as long as you can demonstrate some kind of connection uh, and, and again trace those electrons to the extent you can trace them, uh, I think that adds to your your case for being ITC eligible. I, my only hesitation of going beyond that is because we've seen so many different types of configurations that it's hard to provide additional clarity to, yeah. to someone without actually being able to look at the system. I mean, there's sort of a, a gut level attractiveness to proximity, you know, governing a determination, but that, that is not a specific requirement in the tax law currently. Okay, great. So there's a lot of questions about how to, to do the annual measuring and how that would work. Um, a couple people wanted to know if you can show that the, the annual PV output, uh, output is above the 75% or even above the, the capacity of the storage, would that be one way to qualify the device? Uh, or do you have to go beyond that? Good question. I think, I mean, at the beginning, my, my question is always, you know, can you trace the electrons going into the, the storage device? Um, if, for example, you have a system where, you know, they're co-located and they might be paired, but, you know, you can clearly identify or, or you can, from a, on a technical level, note that, no solar electrons are, are going into that storage device. In our view, I think uh, that's, again, a risky risky endeavor. So when we work on a potential measurement method, it can get complicated to come up with something that's useful outside of a second-by-second -second real-time tracking of electrons. And so I think there's some gray area there um, that you can come up with a, a reasonable method. But at the end of the day, you know, you're only showing 1% solar electrons going into the battery, you know, that's, that's going to be far outside of the spectrum of probably what most people would consider reasonable. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to do two more questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up here. Uh, this one's a couple of parts here. So, so one person is wondering if a, a manufacturer's statement of compliance uh, via network monitoring would suffice uh, to meet the 75% the cliff uh, tracking. And, and a related question is, um, if you have additional metering equipment um, and, and tracking devices, would that qualify as part of the ITC or, or makers as part of the energy system? Good question. Uh, I think on the, um, the first part of the question, I know in the, the 25D context, you know, you can have homeowners who can rely on, on certain certifications about their uh, their eligibility. Uh, in in the 48 context, there, there's nothing allowing that, so it is incumbent on the taxpayer claiming the credit to you know to document what they think is their their annual use. Um, that would certainly, in our minds, probably be one piece or data point that would go to your ultimate conclusion. Um, but uh, we certainly wouldn't recommend to a, a taxpayer to just look at that paper and, you know, not do their, their right. homework. Right. The statutory construct is different between the, the, I would say, the residential applications where a manufacturer's certification can be relied upon, and if that certification proves false, then there are penalties and the government has recourse with the manufacturer that made that certification. When you get into commercial systems, that regime does not exist. So you have, you know, the, the configuration and the use of the battery storage system. You have, think in terms of two timelines. You have the intended use when you design and you install the system, and then there, just given the recapture rules, you have you have an annual um, check-in basically of actual use versus intended use to to validate 
uh, your original conclusions. And as far as additional components for the monitoring, uh, I think, you know, when we work on solar wind projects, generally there are lots of systems and, and metering devices and components that, that do qualify for uh, the ITC. So on that, much like those systems without a, a storage device, you just have to look at, you know, how those systems are being used, how the components or equipment uh, is being used, and, you know, is, is it part of that solar energy facility or, or project um, as far as determining ultimately the eligibility. Great. So I think we're probably out of time at this point. Um, I just, again, I want to thank you guys, uh, Gary and Joel, for joining us. This was an excellent presentation, a lot of good information. Uh, sorry to everyone whose questions we did not get to. Um, but again, please please reach out to these guys because obviously they, they know a lot about this. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sam for some, some last thoughts, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Seth. Um, so we do have some upcoming webinars that may be of interest to some of the folks on, on the line. Um, you can see on your screen we've got about five coming up that are related to resilient power and energy storage. You'll find details about all of those webinars on our website at resilient-power.org. And we also have um, a distribution list. We send out a monthly newsletter related to resilient power and a weekly solar plus storage newsletter. So for more information about the Resilient Power Project, our reports, our webinars, upcoming and archived, um, and all of our other resources, you can visit our website, resilientpower.org. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.